All right, welcome to the two sample t-test lecture and I'm going to go over three different ways of setting this up using the GLM. But before we can get to that, make sure you're ready for this. So firstly, have you fully mastered contrast? So you should have a pretty firm grasp on how contrasts are constructed for regression models. Likewise, you should be pretty comfortable with the one sample t-test. If you're not, then revisit either the contrast and linear models lecture or the one sample t-test lecture or both. So my setup that I'm going to be using for the two sample t-test, this is the dependent variable. This is not the same subject over and over, but instead I have four subjects from group one, and I'm just referring to them as A1, and then I have or I'm sorry, five subjects, and then five unique subjects who are in group two. So I'm writing it out this way. So that's just the structure. So the groups could be patients and control, males and females, it doesn't matter. So this is a cell means setup. I will cover cell means in more detail when I go over ANOVA. FYI, a two sample t-test is an ANOVA. It's a one-way ANOVA with two levels. Um, just, it's kind of special, so we study it by itself. Anyhow, this is called a cell means approach because we model the mean for each cell separately. So you can see this first regressor is an indicator, meaning it takes a value of one for everybody in group one. So it's an indicator for group one. The second regressor is an indicator for group two. So I have a one for everybody who is in group two. And in this setup, beta one is the mean for group one and beta two is the mean for group two. Be careful though, you'll see in a little bit, it might be, um, you might intuitively want to always conclude that when you have a regressor with this structure of zeros and ones, you might want to conclude, oh, well this has ones for everybody in group two, so I'm just going to conclude this is modeling the mean for group two. And that's not always the case. It is the case in this model uh, because um, if I multiply this matrix by this vector, I'm gonna get beta one, beta one, beta one, beta one, beta one, beta two, beta two, beta two, beta two, beta two. Therefore, beta one is the summary measure for all the subjects in group one. Beta two is the summary measure for all the subjects in group two. And as we learned in the one sample t-test um, tutorial, since we're using least squares, the summary measure will be the mean. So. That's why that's the case. So the, we're still focusing on one-sided hypothesis test here because I'm assuming this is something you're transferring to a whole brain analysis and most statistics software for imaging data run the tests in a one-sided fashion. So let's say we're interested in detecting where the mean of group one is larger than the mean for group two. So that's our alternative hypothesis, beta one greater than beta two because beta one is the mean of group one, beta two is the mean of group two. Remember, we need a zero on one side of our inequality. Specifically, we need the inequality to point at the zero, or you could think of it as the inequality is eating the betas if it's a little Pac-Man. Anyway, so this is the structure we want to get things in because then we can just strip our contrast values right off of this equation. So we know our contrast is going to be one minus one. So that's it. So this contrast, one minus one, will test if the mean of group one is larger than the mean of group two. To get the opposite, if you want to find where the mean of group two is larger, you would use the negative of this contrast or negative one, one. And my apologies, this should be a greater than symbol here and I accidentally put an equal. Okay. This is an equivalent model, meaning it fits the data exactly the same, exactly the same hypotheses can be tested, but the parameterization is different. And you have to be careful because again, a lot of people when they're first learning this model, myself included, I wanted to say that the beta two, the parameter with this that corresponds to the second regressor, I said, oh, beta two is the mean for group one because it's an indicator variable, um, but it's not. And that's because of this first column. So in order for that to be true for indicators to correspond to means, um, you must have a setup where each, each row has exactly one one in it and no other numbers. So all of your regressors must be ones and zeros and each row can only have a single one and that isn't the case here. So we cannot jump to that conclusion. 
So what, what, what are beta 1 and beta 2 in this model? Well, whenever you get stuck on a model, I highly recommend either plugging in some real numbers and looking at the, the plotted fitted values, but you have to be careful because some numbers are a little special, like you wouldn't use zero, and um, sometimes numbers accidentally uh, cancel out and mislead you. Um, and you could always, and you should always ask yourself if your model's doing what you want it to do. Is it flexible enough to fit the data the way you want it to, or is it too flexible? And that will probably become more clear when we talk about ANOVAs, like two by three ANOVAs or something like that. Okay, so let's do that with this model. We're gonna multiply it out. Instead of plugging in numbers, I'm just going to leave the betas because then I don't have to worry about special cases where numbers drop out. So if I go through and I multiply this matrix by this vector, so you go across the rows of this matrix, multiply down the column of this vector, for every subject who's in group one, you can see I'm gonna get beta one plus beta two. And for all the subjects in group two, I'm going to get just beta one. So do you see how weird that is? So the intuition was that the second regressor was the, um, the uh, mean for group one, but it's not at all. Um, and the first regressor looks like the overall mean and it isn't, it's actually the mean for group two. Typically, we refer to this as the baseline. The baseline is the thing that wasn't modeled. So group one is explicitly modeled, so the baseline is group two. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You can see from this simple multiplication, beta one is the mean for group two. If you want the mean for group one, you're going to need to use a contrast that's the sum of the two. And actually, that's all you need. Um, then the mean, right, I just said this, the mean of group two is beta one. And if you subtract those two lines, just apply standard algebra, we get that the mean of group one minus the mean of group two is beta two. So beta two is our difference, specifically in the order of group one minus group two, which is important because we're doing one-sided hypotheses, so you don't wanna get this order switched. Okay, so what is the contrast for the mean of group one? One, one. Um, what about the contrast for the mean of group two? That's just one zero, that was our beta one. Then if you wanna test if the mean of group one is larger than the mean of group two, remember we need a zero on one side, the inequality has to point at a zero. So I subtract the mean of group two from both sides and I get this expression here. So that gives me my contrast. It's a little different. Before it gave us a contrast directly in terms of the betas, but now it's in terms of these expressions about means. So all you have to do is replace each mean of G1, mean of G2 with the contrast for each of these separate things, and then you can apply algebra to the contrasts. The mean of group one is one, one. The mean of group two is one, zero. If you subtract the two, you get one minus one, which is zero, one minus zero, which is one. So zero, one tests if group one is greater than group two. Likewise, if you wanna know if uh, group two is larger than group one, you would um, use the zero minus one contrast. There's one more way. I'm just gonna show this one to you and it's up to you to figure it out. It's a little, a little um, homework, I guess. This follows what we'll see soon in the uh, ANOVA lectures is called a factor effect setup. So I have one column of ones and another column that's ones and then minus ones. So you should be able to take what I just showed you for the last setup, and you can construct the mean for group one, the mean for group two, and then you can do group one minus group two, just directly subtract those two contrasts. And just a quick, I just wanna point something out here. I think I said this, but I just wanna reiterate this. To get the contrast, you can actually just strip it right off of the design matrix. So what you do is you ask yourself, does everybody in group one have an identical row in the design matrix? Yeah. Well, if the answer is yes, then your contrast is that row. So that tells me right off the bat, oh, the contrast for the mean of group one is just one, one, because that's what the common row of the design matrix is. Ditto for group two, everybody has a one zero, so that is my contrast, one zero. So it's a fast way. So you can now apply that right here really quick, get the contrast for group one, contrast for group two. Subtract them, you're done.
Did you get it? Um, there are often many ways to parameterize the same model. There are more than what I just showed you even. So it's really good to, especially with these simple models, if you practice multiplying the design matrix with the parameter vector and trying to visualize it that way, it'll help you um, understand any buddy model. If you go to help a friend, they're like, I need help setting up an ANOVA, and you're like, I'm an expert. And you go and you look at how they started it, um, you can figure out where, what they were doing and help them fix their model without forcing them to go with your favorite way of doing it, I suppose. That is it. Thank you very much. Um, please join the Facebook group, Mumford Brain Stats, and have a great day.